Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to your Critique of the Week. It is Friday, October 14th. So glad you could join me. Uh, let's see. we got D. Coleman here. we got Cindy Gore, Tom Barlow, Gordon Coppola's here. Been a while for Gordon. Good to see you, Gordon. Uh, James Langford's here. Terry R. Vita Kumar. Good to see you, Vina. Um, over on Facebook right now, we have no one commenting yet, but usually it takes a while. There's Katie Dozier. Hey, Katie. Um, let's see. So it looks like it's working on all platforms. So for uh, this week's Critique of the Week, we'll be doing something that we do occasionally, which is a kind of grab bag episode. So um, if you'd like to participate normally in the Critique of the Week, uh, what you have to do is go through Submittable and submit two poems and, um, and it, in the Critique of the Week category. Um, that's all you have to do, just submit two poems. And then I pull them out at random. I use a random number generator to figure out who the next guests are every week. But what happens is, though, if um, if some of the guests just have like very short poems or um, or just one poem and not two, it's hard to make an episode out of. So I uh, I just skip over them and go to the next person in line. Um, and so there's kind of a buildup of people who didn't send much. But I don't want to leave them hanging. So what we're going to do is move through those poems quickly um, for maybe the first half of the show. Then after that, we're going to switch and. Um, do uh, call, um, you know call in poems or whatever so you can email your poems if you'd like to have a poem critique live on the air today we'll talk about it um, just email it to our um, our open mic email address I'll put that up on the screen really quick it's open mic at rattle.com open mic at rattle.com um, put like critique or something critique this week's critique or something like that in the in the headline in the subject of the email and I will see and know what it's for and then uh if we have time, we'll get to it. You can also ask any questions you have, if you have specific questions, um, um, anything you'd like. So um, if you think of it as like an ask me anything or a check this thing out in this poem kind of thing. Um, whatever you'd like to share. Try to keep the poems on the shorter side, nothing really long, because I want to get through as many people as we can, because we only do this every other month or so. Um, so, or, so yeah, here we go. We got one already from, um, who's this from? Yeah, Deb Tannenbaum sent one already. So, perfect. So, um, yeah, so just keep doing that. And at the end, we'll go through a few of these poems I'd like to clear out and just get back to people. And then um, and then we'll do some of your poems today that you send today. So so let's do that. Um, and as always, though, the point of the critique is to give the workshop experience for free to anybody who wants it. And so uh, I think the workshop, the poetry workshop, is a great experience, a great way to see poems through the eyes of strangers, which is something really hard to do in real life because your friends tell you, you know they don't they know you first of all so they know the background and are used to your poems or and um they also don't want to hurt your feelings and um we just want to be nice and and sharing and caring and try to help people make better poems so leave as many comments as you can in the chat windows i will pass along as many as we go through uh, but let's look at some of these poems first the first one we're going to go to is uh this here by timothy peterson um he sent this in almost a year ago or over a year ago i should say uh, it says, this is the cursor flashes. So let's check this poem out first. Here we go. Again, this is uh, Timothy Peterson. The cursor flashes. And this was one that was pasted in. You can see that there. By the way, this is what I see on Submittable. So I see the title, um, any questions I had, and then if you paste it in the poem. If not, it's um, it comes up as like a, a separate window uh, if it's a file. So anyway, here's... um. Here's uh, the cursor flashes. Absolute pitch black darkness. No sound other than the tinnitus. Yeah, tinnitus ringing. <laughs> no sound other than t the tinnitus ringing. Who's there? Oppressive stillness. WTF, something is there. I can feel it. Despite the lack of sensory stimulus, I scream. Only the ringing is there. Cool nothingness against my dry anxiety. Taut sinew stretch, tension, compression. Avulsion of the mind, alone in the dungeon of the mind. Thoughts unroll like the ominous toolkit of a demented executioner. Stainless steel instruments of doubt and aspiration neatly stored, razor sharp, wielded with the expert precision of decades of decade dedicated malice. A slow, deep, practiced breath. Chest heaves against the omnipresent weight of the self-imposed expectations exhale feel the weightlessness as the chest cavity falls like a skydiver thoughts like the horizon inconceivably distant focus on the flashing cursor what words will appear next exhale patience they will come 
Still the torture and silent creativity, the stainless steel tools of torment, set aside, tool, roll, clinched, closed. Cinched, closed. Another recipe for mindfulness, indexed in the card catalog, the flashing cursor's Morse code sends sleep. So that's an interesting poem. Once again, we are looking at... Um, at um, the Cursor Flashes by Timothy Peterson. And I think, first of all, I think it's an interesting topic, which is one of the things that um, um, made it interesting for me. I, I, this is a poem where I feel like um, it goes on too long, though. It needs a lot of condensing. Like, if, it, if there's enough substance here for, like, a full poem, I think. Um, but it, it just can sort of continues slowly down the page um, in a way that um, I kind of lose interest Partly, you know, I kind of go, come and go. That, that's my reaction. If I were reading this as a submission. Um, so let's see here. I, I, I kind of point out where. So absolute pitch black darkness. No sound other than the tinnitus ringing. I like this. The whole run about the tinnitus, I think, is the most one of the most interesting things. Because that's an experience, um, you know, some people have and a lot of people don't. And so to be able to pass that on is, is a, makes it a useful poem. Um, no sound other than the tinnitus ringing. Who's there? And when I see the uh, who's there, I'm talking about if I re I'm reading a submission, but if I see the who's there in all caps with three exclamation points, um, that, that strikes me often. Occasionally, something like that can work, but it's, it's, uh, it strikes me as often as something that, that doesn't feel finished or, or polished at all. It's just kind of a shout at me. Um, similar to if you're having like a, like a text exchange and you get the all caps shout, you know, it's, it's very off-putting and not in a way that makes you want to continue reading the poem. So that's a downside. If we were to publish a poem like this, I would change that somehow. Um, and then we, and then we have, um, oppressive stillness on its own line, which, um, and so we have this really stilted kind of feel going through where, where there's no sort of rhythm or flow. Um, each, each little line is doing its own thing. And, um, uh, but that changes later with his scream. So, so what the fuck? Something is there. I can feel it. Despite the lack of sensory stimulus, I scream. Only the ringing is there. See, the only the ringing is there is one of those good, simple lines, I thought. Cool nothingness against my dry anxiety. Taut sinew stretched. Tension, compression, avulsion of the mind. Here I start to get this list isn't very interesting, so I, got to, I start to get a little bored. Alone in the dungeon of the mind, thoughts unroll like uh, the ominous toolkit of a demented executioner. Very interesting. So it's a very interesting image that they unroll like the ominous toolkit of a demented executioner. It takes a little while for that image to be generated, for me anyway. Um, I think maybe because it's a long phrase and executioner's at the very end, but it leaves me sort of, I, I'm sort of struggling to picture it and then I get it and then I'm to the next line, which is a totally different image. Um we, well, we have the stainless steel instruments, but then they're abstractified to doubt and as, aspiration. So I think here it'd be cool to expand on this this concept, like linger on this image. So, it, you know, we always talk about how image is so important to poems. Um, and it's an interesting image. So if you can linger there and let us think about it and really, really conjure that image of it, it will make the poem stronger. So I would kind of keep with that executioner. Instead of going to the abstract with the doubts and aspiration, I would, um, you know, continue describing it making it that a scene maybe um you know one second because i forgot i always forget this when we do this kind of thing i have to move the comments to another window so that i can actually see them otherwise okay there we go otherwise i can't pass along your comments um because i can't have the same window up for both okay yeah, and so Gordon Coppola already said the second stanza might be a stronger start to the poem. And I agree with that. So um, let me get the poem back. Um, yeah, so here, so here's the poem again. Um, no sound other than the tinnitus ringing is the second stanza. And I agree that's a much better start than the absolute darkness. Tom Barlow says dungeon of the mind is cliche. Um, Terry R. says the ice cream line starts overstatement that doesn't serve the poem well. And Vina Kumar says, I agree about the tinnitus being the most interesting thread in this piece. Yeah, yeah, I agree completely with that. Um, Sidney Gun Putnam Guntherman says it needs to be shortened and tightened. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, hey, and Sharon Ferrante's back. So glad after the hurricane. Yeah, it's great to see you back, Sharon. I'm glad everything's okay. Or as okay as it can be, given the circumstances. Um, let's see. Okay, we'll keep moving a little bit through this poem. Um, so focus on the flashing cursor. What words will appear next? Exhale, patience, they will come. Still the torturer and silent creativity, the stainless steel tools of torment set aside. Tool roll, cinched, closed. Another recipe for mindfulness indexed in the card catalog. The flashing cursor is Morse code, send sleep. It's an interesting jump to the, to the cursor, too. Um, and any time I, I get a poem about um, the inability to write and like the blank page and a cursor, that's very cliche just in the poetry world. You know, or just, it's just a poem you get all the time. Um, and so, um, I don't know. So, so that's a topic I would avoid unless you can make it really interesting. So what I would do with this poem is condense the most interesting parts, which is the tinnit tinnitus um, being like a torturer. I think it's a very interesting concept um, and works well. And you can take the good lines and make a smaller, slight poem. I would think, you know, this already could make, if you could cut enough out, a good one of those short poems, like a, like a Mike White kind of poem um, with very few lines. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's about it we have to say for this. Let's move on to the next poem. And the next poem is, i got to keep these up uh, so I can let them know that they were on the show today. The next poem, this is one is by um, Kaustav Halder from... One thing about Submittable that's really annoying, I should say. I'm going to put this out there just in case uh, people see it. And I've emailed them about this many, many times. But they have this little window where if I click on it, I can see their info, their name and address if I want to like look at who it actually is, and um, which is what I'm pulling this up from. And they don't include the country. like They have the address but not the country. So I have to figure out he's this um Kostov Halder is from is in Bans Bar Bansberia. I have no idea where that is. So I couldn't even mail him something. Um I would have to download <laughs> sorry, this is just this is a personal rant here. But I would have to download an Excel file um in order to see his actual country, even though I can see this entire rest of his address. It's ridiculous. Just one more line submittable so I can see the country. Thank you very much. But anyway, here is a... Here is Kaustav Halder's poem, um, The Shadow. Let's take a look at this one. The Shadow. The Shadow. A blind, beautiful girl standing under the street lamp. Monsoon eve, cloud cover, the whole sky, moon went to leave. A friend with her, show the way, it's a, it, it a white, thin stick. Her eyes, pole star, the northern sky, came down the street. Lightning. Lighting is singing in the dark, earth felling like a war. Rain comes, breaking the silent of night. Wake up, the nomad. Faint yellow neon light falling on the wet road. She standing alone with transparent, clammy dress, looking at the wet street like a mirror face. A blurry shadow appeared in it. The shadow smiled at her. Oh dear, why are you here? Cross the road. Are you fear? She said in her white lips, I'm blind, waiting for a person, persons, who will be kind. Oh, poor girl, you're silly. You don't see devil is hiding in the dark, teeth like devil shark. Run, I'm with you. It's, it's no long, steps are few. Rainwater comes in her chest from black curly hair, a blue hilly waterfall falling in there. Creature sound into the cloud. Dead child cried. She sh sh shoundered, fell on the road. Run, 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 world began to burn. She stood up, a partner in the deep forest, running to the center of the lonely street. A heavy truck crossed the road, broken white stick, red blood. Now you will see the shadow smiled. So interesting. So kind of Halloweenish story here. A little stories to tell in the dark this is the shadow um what's interesting i mean I, this seems um um this seems a poem probably written in, in someone's second language or translated um and um and, and there's a way that that could work and i think it does for a few sections um it, it gets a little a little tough the translation aspect of it later on in the poem but there's a way that that can really open up different syntax in different ways and make a reading fun 
Um, and so I, I like a lot of the beginning, especially. So a blind, beautiful girl standing under the street lamp, monsoon eve, cloud cover, the whole sky, moon went to leave. Like, it just meant the whole sky, moon went to leave. I love that line. Um, a friend with her show the way in a white, thin stick. Um, her eyes, pole star in the northern sky, came down the street. Again, pole star in the northern sky came down the street. There, there's a way that there's this sort of dreamy aspect of like floating through a strange space and the way that the the images are revealed here in the very beginning that I, I really love. I thought the poem might um, be really working, actually. A friend with her... Um, wait, where I go? Light, lighting is singing in the dark. Another great line. Earth felling like a war. Yeah, I mean, right up to here. It's really... I love this. Rain comes breaking the silent of night. Wake up the nomad. I'm not sure what nomad is. Um, a faint yellow neon light... Um, and then we get into this. It's interesting. It starts to rhyme, and then it, and it becomes more of a story. And when it starts to rhyme and becomes more of a story, I lose a lot of interest. The story doesn't have as much grippingness as the images that are playing out in interesting ways in the beginning. Um, yeah. So Clayton Clark says, "Love that moon went to leave." Yeah. Yeah. So um, over on Facebook, let's see. Yeah, Sharon Friend says, yes, I'm thinking translated. It has some really good stuff. I agree. Um, um, Katie Dozier says, um, some great images and sounds. The dialogue took me out of it a bit. Yeah. So so I think this poem, if um if if you know to continue with it, I think I think it loses me when it gets to the shadow smile at her and it becomes a story told in dialogue. Um in the rhyme. Um you know, I think if that was cut out and we just left painting the picture, um, condensing it again, um, a lot of stuff is just because we're all like natural poets. I mean, that's the thing that that nobody really I mean, that we just are. So we generate really interesting thoughts if we let ourselves go. Um, but then we get into this sort of mode where we're we've written too much and it's too much storytelling um, or, or too much rhyme or we get into like a rut. And so it, anybody can generate like words that can make a good poem and you can just craft them into something good if you just condense and combine the, the stuff that's good and know how to recognize the stuff that's good. And so we pointed out some of the stuff that's good. That's what I would do with this poem is, um, is condense, cut the stuff that's not working and, and keep the stuff that's, that's strong. And, and uh, I think you can make a good poem out of it. Um, let's see. Okay. We're going to move on to the next poem, but but thanks for sharing that. Once again, that was um, The Shadow by um, Kostov Halder. And uh, here we go with the next poem. This one is... Un oh, this one this one was interesting. Instead of... Um, I remember com this coming across this. This is um, Anastasia Volaunius um, from um, the UK. And for this one, for the critique, um, um, Anastasia sent... Instead of just uh, sending one poem... She sent an entire book, um, so so I couldn't recruit. I mean, it was like it's like thirty pages long, so I couldn't do this for the critique of the week. But we can take a quick look at it. It does seem like maybe one poem. I mean, it's all so connected. You'll see. Let's take a look at this. And so this is the um, the view you get from um, if it's a file attachment, by the way, and submittable. So this is the first poem. That the it's called Untitled. Um, let me just see what the um, and the question is, um, what are women expected to do? So I'm not sure. See, I don't even I'm sure. Some people uh, submit to this, and I don't even know if they know what they're submitting to. Uh, but we'll pretend. I mean, there's a the whole bunch of instructions, and there's a little quick box to click to make sure you you know you're what you're going to. Uh, but let's see. This is woman, uh, or untitled. Uh, but you'll see. I'll, I'll look at a couple of these. A woman caged like a bird. Oh Maya, it is still so blurred. We have the racism, fascism, communism, cynicism, criticism, the barbarism, elitism, the narcissism, and the Darwinism. Oh, Maya, your lyricism still sings with humanism. Oh, Maya, sing like a caged bird once more, will you please? So that's the first poem, kind of like an introductory poem. And then you see here, the next poem is also called Women. And th for 30 pages, uh, there's short poems um, that are called Woman. Woman, there's, a be there's beauty in my pain. There are scars left to heal, but the scope of happiness widened and the meaning of life ripened. 
um, third poem, Woman, I live to die, you will live to see. My no is not a yes, your ignorance is not in jest. Um, yeah, so so that's how this goes on. And and I'll tell you my, my impression reading it. I like this run, actually. I didn't think I would. Um, but though we have racism, um, fascism, communism, cynicism, criticism, once you're reading it out loud, it's actually a really fun list, which shows you that the poet has a really ear for language. Um, yeah, and Katie Doder says, uh, what a cool concept. And yeah, it definitely is. Um, so, so I like this. I, I was, when I first read this, I was thinking that this was going to, um, this could really had a lot of potential. And, and, you know, sometimes we've published 30 page poems before. So it was one poem series, 30 pages. It, it could be interesting. Oh Maya, your lyricism still sings with humanism. Oh Maya, the, uh, the cage, sing like a caged bird is a kind of cliche. So that's the first issue, but it, it feels like a nice introduction to what might be coming. Oh my, I sing like a caged bird once more. So, so if you ever, if you ever like need to write something and it turns out to be really cliche, like if you, I mean, if, if this was like you had to go to a caged bird, just don't you, just don't phrase it like caged bird. Don't say sing like a caged bird because that's something that we've heard a thousand times. It becomes instead of see, see what it, language works like a kind of constellation. Um, in your in your neural synapses in the in the frontal lobe there, and um, and, and what's really exciting about metaphor is that it takes sort of two constellations and combines them into one, and, and it makes new connections in your in your brain, and um, and what happens is that so so the first time we hear a caged bird sings, um, we get really excited because we learn something, we get this new connection, two things that were different concepts are connected now in our brain. And it pro- I assume it releases like dopamine and we get a hit out of that. And that's part of language acquisition. But we love it and we learn from it. And that's great. That's what the power of metaphor. But then what happens is that once we've heard it so many times, it just becomes a, s- a single constellation. It's a chunk. And um, in that chunk, it doesn't give that same stimulation. So if you want to say something, if it had to be a singing like a caged bird, use different words. Um, instead of a bird, make it some specific bird. Instead of a cage, make it a bird cage. Anything that you can kind of like throw the brain off to make it at least interesting. And then you won't have that problem of being a cliche, which doesn't really, isn't stimulating. So, so make that a good line and not caged bird. But, but other than that, I like the intro to this. Um, yeah, Daniel Menden says, so a quotation rather than a cliche. Yeah, but I think it's more than just a quotation. It's like a concept. Um, it becomes, instead of... It's almost like the um, the figurative becomes literal, um, and then and if you watch our um, er, read our interview coming up with um, in the winter issue with uh, Ian McGilchrist, which is just fascinating, he go talks about this in detail. It's really it becomes something processed, a, a, a real fresh metaphor, or something processed in the right hemisphere, um, and and once it becomes a cliche, it's processed in the left. So you'll you'll learn about more that more. Um, um, this winter, but it's fascinating. But anyway, so um, and I'm showing you a white page. Um, so this woman, this is the second poem. Women, there's beauty in my pain. So that's very cliche again. Beauty in my pain, and and sort of there's a melodrama to pain too. Um, there are scars, and the source of the scars are kind of a cliche. Like these are just concepts and poems that come up a lot, and which we don't have a lot of emotional reaction to it because they're so, you know, overused. The scope of happiness widened. The meaning of life ripened. So, um, so interesting here. I, I like the concept of, of, of having this kind of dialogue and there's something about the voice. There's definitely a sense of music in the language. Um, but, um, um, yeah, so, so I like the sounds of it. Um, it's just not pushing into sort of original experience. It's, it's, it's using too much cliche. Um, so I like the idea of it. Um, my advice here um, would really be to read more poetry, just to be completely honest, um, and and sort of push your push yourself further into sort of freshness. Um, so um, so some people over on so it's Tom Barlow and Deb T. So they, they're saying um, that if she listens, she's leaning on Maya Angelou a bit too much here, says Tom. Um, uh, Deb T says, I think she's addressing Maya Angelou who titled her book that. Yeah, I mean, that's why it's a cliche because it's, uh, her book is so well known that, um, that, that it be- it's become a cliche. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so Clayton Clark says, agree, Tom. Love the concept, the sounds, but the language could use a little makeover. That's my, my impression of this, too. Okay, let's look at one more, and then we'll move on to um, the kind of open lines critique, and we'll see what we have there. There's two short poems here. These ones are by Elizabeth Daniel from Kentucky. Elizabeth Daniel from Kentucky. Um, and this is, um, there's two short poems here. Fireproof is the first one, so let's take a peek at this. Fireproof. I can feel the heat rising up to meet me. I can feel the flames closing in all around, tempting my feet to fall on unstable ground. Oh, but I know Jesus stands with me. We're walking side by side. I am ready for battle. We'll clear the way for victory. Interesting. That's fireproof. I can feel the heat rising up to meet me. I can feel the flames closing in all around. Um... So we jump, you know, we get the fireproof as a title, which leads toward what we're going to talk about. So it's a, it's a working title. I can feel the heat rising up to meet me. I can feel the flames closing in all around. I think that's a nice start to the poem. Um, it already has a rhythm where I'm expecting a rhyme, and then we get the rhyme. We get the heat and the feet, and then the ground around and the ground, tempting my feet to fall on unstable ground. Oh, but I know Jesus stands with me. We're walking side by side. I am ready for battle. He'll clear the way for victory. And so for this poem, it's so short and so concise, but it tells a, a meaningful story that I was thinking here um, that I just wish it was, the, the rhyme was consistent. You know, it's not too hard to do that with a simple poem. Here I would recommend reading a bunch of Wendy Vidalock. Um, I just bring up the same poets all the time because there are certain poets who are just great at certain things. And um, Wendy, Wendy Vidalock is great at, um, at, at short, tight rhyming poems. I mean, she's just the the current master of that. Um, another poet to look at is Kay Ryan. Um, she does rhyming poems where the rhymes are a little more hidden. Um, but but Wendy does a, does them in this kind of way where they're fit in the meter and playing with the meter. Um, and I would do that here. So so this I can feel the heat rising up to meet me. I can feel the flames closing all around, tempting my feet to fall on the un, on unstable ground. So keep those rhymes coming through and that and that rhythm coming through too. Oh, but I know Jesus stands with me. Like the with me doesn't. I mean, I guess the with me kind of rhymes with victory, but um, and maybe if you pull that up and cut out the oh, but so it was just I know Jesus stands with me. We're walking side by side, and the heel in the me kind of rhyme too. Um. But the victory is so slight. I just like the, the meter to be more regular and the rhyme to stand out more. It felt it felt weirdly like a letdown of the rhyme. So I think I would tighten this poem up in, in, in that way. Maybe make it, um, you know, keep this form. Like, repeat this again. The, the, um, the rhyme here, the heat, you know, the flames, make it come back. I don't know. Play with the rhyme here and make it, make it feel like a tight little poem. Um, Gordon Coppola says maybe rewrite it to get rid of the pronouns until maybe the line with me. That's interesting too. Yeah, good suggestion, Gordon. Yeah. So so feel the heat rising up, feel the flames closing all around. So so maybe it's like that. It's a good suggestion to try. Um over on YouTube or Facebook, let's see. Um, yeah, so once again, I, we probably already had enough people send, uh, send poems. Um, sometimes I see someone asking, cause I came in a little late. If you'd like to share a poem and, and have yours critiqued on the open line, um, um, today, like right now, all you have to do is send it to, oops, not that one. Um, this email address, the open lines email address, open mic at rattle.com, put like critique today in the subject line. I think we already have more people than we can get to in the next half hour, but we'll see. I mean, if we have more more time, we'll have more time. We've we've always every time we've done this, we've run out of time. So, and I can go a little extra, but but I can't go that far. Um, anyway, yeah. So let's let's just read the other poem really quickly too, and see how that plays out. Because there are two really short poems with this one that we were looking at, Celestial Sirens. Um, together they were a supernova, burning red hot across the skies, though their fire dimmed. Celestial hunger never dies. Celestial sirens, interesting. So this one sort of did what I was asking it to in the last poem, where it, where it makes the rhyme regular, at least. Together they were a supernova, burning red hot across the skies. 
though their fire dims, celestial hunger never dies. It feels incomplete, though. So again, I mean, for, the four lines um, are, are enough to make me interested, but I'd like to hear more. Um, so maybe another stanza in this rhyme scheme for that one. Um, hmm. Yeah. Let's see. So Sharon Fronte says, I'm a short poem writer, but I can't seem to give suggestions on this. Maybe stronger descriptions. Yeah, I mean, again, um, you know, coming up with stuff that's that's fresh and not cliche is really the key to making a poem be something that that excites people and connects with people and, and is memorable. Um, and so, you know, a supernova, again, burning red hot is another cliche. You know, you have to find ways to say things uniquely in an original way so that they stand out and actually like stick in people's brains and make something happen in the, in the brain. Um, and that's how you get the feeling, you know, like Emily Dickens said of your top of your head taken off or you get the goosebumps or, um, or that kind of physical feeling where you're connecting so much. It's through the, the sort of magical weaving of original images um, and, and, and cliches just don't work that way. And so, I mean, it feels like it, it, a lot of people, it, it seems to me, feel like a cliche is something that's like um, like some grammar rule or something that like a teacher says, no cliches on a test. And, it, and it's just like um, the same as saying like you have to capitalize every word or something. Or I mean, every, you know, like proper nouns or like use the right punctuation. But it's not that at all. Like punctuation is like a thing that helps us read, um, you know, and, and it's useful to have conventions, but it's not a convention. It's an actual thing. That, that makes it so we can't connect with a poem if it's full of cliches. Um, so, so coming up with original ways of describing things, it's like the main job of a, of a poet or any writer, really. Um, like that's what we do is come up with a unique way to describe something, either something that you've already felt but now can s describe in this new way or something that you haven't felt at all but can, but can empathize and relate to because you've had it described for you for the first time so well. And so describing things in new ways are what poetry is all about. And so burning red hot just doesn't do it as much as the, you know, as much as the idea of the poem works fine and the, and the rhyme is nice. It just doesn't do it if it's full of cliches. So, so get rid of cliches. No cliches. It's just, it's just the basic, really the most important thing, the most important piece of advice you could get for any poem. Um, let's see. Okay, let's go move on to the... Um, Okay, yeah, let's move on to the uh, open lines portion, see what we got here. I'm going to leave all these up. I'll close these. Oop, don't want to do that. Um, where am I going? Ah. Okay, let me see. So this is what I'm doing. Okay. Yeah, so we have plenty to look at. We'll try to move through as fast as we can. We'll start with that one we mentioned by uh, Deb Tannenbaum. Um, and if you have, I'll look and see if you have any, um, any questions too. So not just poems, but I'll see if you have any questions. And, um, this is, uh, from Dead Tannenbaum. I kind of like this poem written in response to a rattle prompt, but maybe it's too slight. Maybe that's okay. But I wonder if you in the group think it has potential to be more. If so, any suggestions? Another question I have is about your reading of submissions. I imagine you have hundreds of poems being submitted all the time. Do you read all of them? Do you get tired of reading poems? How do you cope? <laughs> That's Deb Tannenbaum. Yeah, thanks, Deb. So to answer that question first, um, yeah, we have about um, 250 submissions a day. So um, it's like almost a full-time job just reading them. And, um, and me and Megan split it up. And um, so she'll take certain things to read, and I'll take other things to read, like different projects. And, um, and it kind of, it's, it's interesting. It, it's like, you're always kind of like panning for gold or something. Like you're like reading and you're kind of like shaking your little, little pan and seeing the stuff settle out. And then if you feel a little fluck of gold, you're like, yeah, you know, <laughs> that's really how it feels. And it does become like, if you imagine somebody who was on uh, gold mining all their lives, there's that kind of like way that it's, you don't even, it's like, I don't know, it's so like habitual or something. It's so something you've done so many times that you don't really think about much until you see the flick of gold. And the flick of gold is always like a great line, a great image, a great metaphor, or it's like 
just something interesting that you haven't seen before or it's um a sense of music like you hear i mean really maybe that's the main thing first is you hear this kind of sense of music that the poet has an idea of how the natural music of speech can be put on a page um or yeah yeah so it's that kind of thing and you and once you sort of see it in the same way like a gold miner will be like see a little fleck and they'll get excited and you know we'll go from being sort of distracted or distractible or just daydreaming to like suddenly intensely focused on uh, on what's going on then you read that poem really closely and you're like oh cool or like oh that was just a tiny fleck or it's fool's gold it's pyrite you know and then you and then you put the chunks of gold you got that day to the side and um and then you look at them and weigh them later and that's kind of how it goes so that's how submissions go but it's you know 250 submissions a day i think and a lot of them are four poems each so it's maybe five, six, seven hundred poems a day, and we just spend half a day moving through poems. It's just it's like a job. So I mean, it is a job. So that's how that works. So just to tell you, now let's look at this poem, and we're going to see if it has potential to be more. If it's too slight, any suggestions for moving it ahead? So thanks for sharing this and for that question, Deb. This is memory watercolors, a scene of. So here we go. Memory watercolors, a scene of. Three-year-old me alone at the edge of the ocean, forgotten. A smudge dot no one sees, stranded on soggy sand, looking around, fringes of waves race in, tickle, then turn to flee. I laugh, solo by the sea, soaked in sun, and I've become a curve of smile, breathing in my first memory of being, a watery streaming, melted and crisp, the briny sea conjuring, whispering, be. I like that a lot. Thanks for sharing that, Deb. Memory watercolors a scene of i'm not sure about the title and the title wasn't something that made me excited to read it memory watercolors a scene of and i'm not sure if it's necessary um i mean it can just jump in the three-year-old me alone at the edge of the ocean so i think you don't need to have that read-in title um and i think maybe something different to kind of pl- you know i don't know something just a little more interesting might work better because memory and watercolor are actually two things that are pretty common in titles um, but after that i like it a lot three-year-old me alone at the edge of the ocean forgotten a smudge dot no one sees stranded on soggy sand the soggy sand it's not quite cliche but i think maybe it's a it could be a stronger phrase looking around fringes of waves race in tickle then turn to flee i laugh solo by the sea i love that internal rhyme there that's great um and really, this, this is painting a really a great image of a really nice nice memory. So, and I like it a lot. I'm really taken there. Solo by the sea, soaked in sun. And I've become a curve of smile. I love that phrase, too. I've become a curve of smile, breathing in my first memory of being a watery streaming. A water streaming is a weak spot, too, I think. I would fix that up, do something more interesting there. Melted and crisp, the briny sea conjuring, whispering, B and I love the ending the rhyme there you know rhyme we're, we're conditioned which is why I like jingles rhyme so if, if something rhymes we feel like it's more true and there's actually studies about that and um so so uh, uh, that's why sonnets we love sonnets so much because there's a couplet at the end and the sort of conclusion it just rings true because it has that rhyme and this is, works in that same way as a sonnet does um, in, in a way that's surprising. The briny sea conjuring whispering you have no idea what's coming when you get to that spot and then B so I think it's a great ending um, with this poem, I think it is done. Um, yeah, as Joe Barker says, nice sounds, nice flow. Um, I think it's just a few things to clean up. The watery streaming, the soggy sand, maybe the smudged dot. There are a few things I think could be described a little better and a better title. But otherwise, I think the poem, there's a sense of movement. It, it, it paints a scene and it gives you meaning to the scene and makes it, it makes it sort of feel that, I mean, I got a little bit of a goosebumpy feel reading that last B. Like, because you don't know what the sea's going to tell you. And then the, the sea tells you to be, which is just a wonderful thing, especially at the three-year-old age and to remember this. It's really cool. I like it a lot. So just a little bit of polish up here, Deb, and, and it's good. And, and everyone's saying, like, great poem, says Katie Dozier. Sharon Ferrante loves it. Um, let's see. Yeah, that is one thing. So Jenny Middleton says, is the smudge dot the child? And there is, there's one thing that I think, and I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that, because I did have this thought, but then forgot about it, <laughs> is that there's this, um, well, I don't know. I guess I didn't, I guess it's fine. For a second, I felt like a little lost with the smudge dot in the sense of perspective. 
because um, three old me alone at the edge of the ocean, forgotten a smudge dot no one sees. That pulls the camera kind of back way into um, a faraway scene. And, and really the whole rest of the poem is like up close with the with a figure, even maybe like from the figure's perspective. And so there's a, a subtle, you know, a sudden kind of shift in the, like the camera um, at that point. Um, and I, I don't know, for a second, the first time I read it, I, I felt a little off put by that. But the second time I liked it actually is it set the stage in a really concise way. So I, I like it. Um, Andrea um, Sapu Dobrika says maybe a reference of how childhood memories have this fuzziness to them, like watercolor paintings. Um, Jane Milton says a scene by the painter. Yeah. So, so yeah, so maybe that's, hmm. Yeah. Maybe just like watercolor could be the title or something like that. Um, I don't know. I just come up with some, you know, that's one of those things where you kind of can just, just throw out, um, possibilities. Just, just, what could you call it? What could you call it? What could you call it? Just write down a list of possible things. And then one thing will jump out at you and then maybe call it that. That's what I would do. Okay, but let's, we got to kind of move quick so we can get to a lot of these. Next up, thanks for sharing those. And that uh, cool question too, Deb. I appreciate it. Um, next up we have um, Sharon Ferrante. Oh, Sharon Ferrante's email seems dangerous. I think, I don't know why you're, why you're so dangerous. <laughs> um, but let's see. It's just the spam. I'm just joking, Sharon. You're not dangerous. Um, but I'll show you this. Well, I can't show you because I don't want to show the email address. But I got one of those Google warnings. Thunder echoes. Here we go. Thunder echoes. A hawk descends beyond the cabin. Leonard Cohen pours another wine for the traveler. Oh, that's cool. Thunder echoes. I mean, this is almost like a haiku in its format. Thunder echoes. Like a, like a stretched out haiku. <laughs> yeah, Sharon is dangerous. You're right. Um, so thunder echoes. A hawk descends beyond the cabin. Leonard Cohen pours another wine for the traveler. I just really like that. I don't know. I like your short poems, Sharon. Um, um, the thunder echoes, I think, maybe could be a little better. Um, and I'm not even sure if that's a title or part of the poem. Let me see. I have to turn it off this. Oh, you know why it said you're, um, I think it's because there's no subject. It says similar messages were used to steal people's personal information. I think it's because you just left the subject blank and it just has no subject. But, um, oh, the title here, I think it's the title Leonard Cohen, Chirita. Oh, no title for Chirita. Oh, that's a form I don't know. Okay, let me see. Let's look at this up so we can learn about it. Um... Poetry forms. This is from the Poets Collective. So here we go. We'll learn. We'll all learn about this form together. And thanks, Sharon, for letting us know. Um, here. Um, that's too big, but I'll read it for you. Chirita, Chirita is a linked poetry form of one, two, and three line stanzas. Chirita is the melee word for story or tale. A charita consists of a one line stanza followed by a two line stanza and the finishing with a three line stanza. It can either be written solo or by up to three partners. Oh, that's cool. Um, the charita tells wait, where'd I go? The charita tells a story. It was created by I, um, I Lee, a UK poet and artist, on uh, 1997 in memory of her grandparents who were raconteurs. I never knew what that word meant, raconteurs. Um, extraordinaire. She was also inspired by Larry Kimmel's sensitive recognition of a shorter form um, contained within the opening three-verse stanza of Ailee's Lunenga, which was created in 1997. Um, Trita rose out of the English language haiku and tanker tradition, but a more anecdotal or nano-narrative in nature. Hey, this is really neat. So thanks for sharing this. Um, I think that's about it. Yeah, okay. So very cool. So thanks for sharing that. Um <laughs> Yeah, very cool form. Yeah, I agree. So, um, so Thunder Echoes. The the only one I don't like, uh, to be honest, I think Thunder Echoes doesn't do it justice. I like the hawk de de descends um, behind beyond the cabin. I love the beyond the cabin. Like the hawk descends on its own wouldn't work, but the beyond the cabin is really nice. And I love the last three: Leonard Cohen pours another wine for the traveler. Um, that's great. Our raconteur is a storyteller. Thanks, Tuesday. So, so I'm learning a lot. I learned um. 
this Chirita form. I learned what, um, finally, after 42 years on this earth, I've learned what raconteur means. Thank you. Without even looking it up. That's the beauty of uh, live streams. Thank you. Okay. So thunder echoes, a hawk descends beyond the cabin. I don't have any real suggestions. I just, I think thunder echoing. Hmm. I don't know. Can something else echo or can it do something with other than echo? Hmm. Is there a way, a different word? I don't know. There's something a little bit flat about that first line to me. Um, but otherwise, I like it a lot. Um, but yeah, thanks for sharing that form. I'm uh, sorry I didn't have more advice. Yeah, so Sharon will work on the echo. Okay, let's go next to Joe Barca. And here's a golden shovel poem by Joe Barca. This is a golden shovel after Kevin Young. Um, here we go. My father's funeral. And so the golden shovel, um, I think most people, it's it's really the most popular new form. It was um, um, it was Terrence Hayes who developed it. Um, and I think the poem, doesn't it? It's we real cool that, that he, he spins it off of. But um, a line, you take a line from a poet, um, and then each word, the, the last word of each line is that line that you s borrowed. So, the, so the, the line here borrowed is, the borrowed, look, the borrowed handkerchief where she wept returned to me months later, starched, pressed, pressed. So that's the line from um, Kevin Young that this poem was generating. It's a really cool form because it is like the poem sort of like slides. You can almost like see it like sliding out of the old poem. It's almost like a, an acrostic too in a way. Really interesting form. Um, yeah. So here we go. This is uh, Joe Barker once again, my father's funeral. At the curb behind the hearse, I thought about the day my mother told me her heart had been first borrowed, then stolen by my father. On this day, she gripped his handkerchief. The priest stood at the altar of Immaculate Conception Church, where my daughter was now at the lectern, heads bowed as she recited the Irish blessing. We mouthed it with her. Then we wept. I heard my father tell one last joke before he left. He returned to his siblings, to his parents, to his grandparents, to the source. The choir began to sing. My father's voice was inside me. He sang Amazing Grace at many funerals. In the last few months, he was not himself. He said that he wanted to go sooner rather than later. The night before, at the wake, he lay in his only suit with a smile starched on his face. Friends and family marched in, hands clasped, bodies pressed. Another excellent poem. So thanks for sharing this um, in the form, too, uh, Joe. Oh, that's the whole poem by Kevin Young, he says. Okay, interesting. So that's uh, a very short poem by Kevin Young, My Father's Funeral. For me, um, I was a little thrown off by the, and maybe it's just me. It might just be me. But my mother told me her heart had first been first borrowed, then stolen by my father. I wasn't sure when I read that if that was a positive or negative thing. Um, and then by the end, it's clear that it, it was positive. But I was a little confused how to how to read that. And, and, and then that, that sort of, you know, um, soured or like, I don't know damage the rest of my reading of the poem so i think maybe to make that a little clear a little more clear would help but it could just be a, a quirk of mine that i read it wrong in my in my brain i'm um, at the curb behind the hearse i thought about the day my mother told me her heart had been first borrowed then stolen by my father um, on this day she gripped her handkerchief the priest stood at the altar of the of immaculate conception church where my daughter was now at the lectern Heads bowed as she recited the Irish blessing. We mouthed it with her. Then we wept. I heard my father tell one last joke before he left. He returned to his siblings, to his parents, to his grandparents, to the source. I think that's one part it could be stronger too. Um, just I think more. So it could be a little more interesting in that section. A choir began to sing. My father's voice was inside me. He sang Amazing Grace at many funerals. Um, I, I think this too, he's saying Amazing Grace. It's a little too too um, like straightforward. I think it could be said in a little bit more interesting way. Um, like maybe you could you could keep it that length and like describe the way it sounded maybe and just to give it a little more kick 
when we get get to that point because it's an important, impactful point too. So I think that's told a little too flatly. I think that could be, um, like you know, my father's voice was inside me, his voice, and then describe it how he sang "Amazing Grace." You know, um, in his last few months, he was not himself. He said that we wanted to go sooner rather than later. The night before, at the wake, he lay in his only suit with a smile starched on his face. Friends and family marched in, hand clasped, bodies pressed. That's just great. So two things I think could be slightly improved, but it's a really good poem. A very moving and great great description of the scene. And then once you read A Golden Shovel, you kind of always want to read the, the poem again that it's after. It's the borrowed handkerchief where she wept, returned to me months later, starched, pressed. Yeah, yeah. And so that adds a whole layer to the poem to have that the way that this this one poem is related to the other poem, it adds a whole layer to it. So it's really good. And yeah, Jenny Middleton says, I think it's a reference to the, the, the stole my heart thing, but the way it's, it's phrased, uh, it threw me off. So, but it could just be me. So I don't know. Take that with a grain of salt. I always take these, you know, critiques with a grain of salt. Cause who knows? Um, yeah. So Vina Kumar said, I read the stolen in the same way. The funny thing is to steal someone's heart is a cliche good thing, but changing it to stolen makes it different. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah. So there's, there's something about that phrase. Uh, and that was Vina Kumar's note. But I think there's something about that phrase that just it threw me off a little bit. Um, yeah. Gordon Coppola says, skillfully executed golden shovel, which ain't easy. Deb T, the heart borrowed, then stolen. She likes that. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, so Attractive Face says, I'm trying to think of something to compensate and still use borrowed. Yeah, it could be like borrowed, then kept, or like um, borrowed, then, I don't know. I mean, cherish, not those words, but something something along those lines could maybe work in a way that wouldn't throw us off with that. Because other people were thrown off a little bit too. But just something that the twist of the um, the cliché makes it a little confusing i think so i think i would work on that line a little bit um and then the other line i think could be better the, the amazing grace i think it could be a little more a bit of a description but great poem um uh, just some sort of fine tuning and tinkering thanks for sharing that joe see these are all good and this is an example of um if you're watching the critique of the week you're already a really good poet i mean that's just the way it is you care enough to be watching this and um you've been watching it for a while and you're good so, um, you know, better than 80%, at least, of the other the submissions that come in, usually, I would say. Um, so thanks for, for being here and for all getting better at poetry together. Okay, so let's move on to another one. And next up, we have... So there's going to be too many to get through. I, I knew this would happen, but uh, we'll go an extra 15 minutes or so, I think, to get through as many as possible. Here is Gordon Coppola. And the butt dial dilemma. This should be fun. So this is Gordon Coppola, who's here, right here, of course, and he sent me butt dial dilemma. And uh, I got to take a drink of my coffee. Look at that little coffee I've drank already. Like two sips. Okay, well now four. Butt dial dilemma. Pockets are more dangerously willful than we dare to acknowledge. Contacting who knows who without our consent. Implying interest, forcing fellowship, leaving indelible trails we didn't intend. Dark matter imps at play? It could be so. Purses, I'm imagining, are responsible for similar assaults against control. Innocent fingers seeking out lipstick, keys, or Wrigley's extra spearmint gum to mask the evidence of lunch are hijacked, and not without the chance of leather's malice. I heard no programmed muscle, musical, alert, but here's the notice, read and indisputable and logged in recent history. A call from her was missing. The her I haven't spoken to in years, not since the, no, you've got no right to know. With each new iPhone upgrade, her name and number transfer over. Let's not waste breath asking. Let my pocket decide. Very interesting. I love the turn, the movement in this poem. Um, Gordon is just great. So, you know, it, it has a funny... It really, I mean, I was laughing at the title, but Dial Dilemma. Um, uh, pockets are more dangerously willful. I think the beginning of the poem, um, and I had a little bit of trouble getting into it, 
Pockets are more dangerously willful than we dare to acknowledge, contacting who knows who without our consent. There's something that's just a little kind of um, matter of fact about this. There's not a lot of like like pizzazz, you know, going on. And I think it's more interesting when it gets to the... So maybe just start out here. Um, start out down here somewhere. You know, this is sort of like a... The, the beginning is like a summary kind of, of 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 the phenomenon of like pocket dialing. Um. But what if it, if it just started here, like purses I'm imagining are responsible, you know, and then move there so that, I mean, once we see that the, um, you know, then the innocent fingers seeking out lipstick, keys, or really experiment gum to mask the evidence of lunch hijacked and not without malice. I think that, yeah, I think I just like a better description of the ways, I think it would start out better with just a pure interesting descriptions of the ways and not just purses, but many different ways that a, um. That, that pocket dialing could happen um, before transitioning into, I just love the end though. Um, I heard no programmed musical alert, but here's the notice read and indisputable and logged in recent history. A call from her was missed. I love this. The her I haven't spoken to in years since the no, you've got no right to know. I just love that. There's like a, wow, God, a really great line, really, really powerful way to not, way to present that and not tell us. With each new iPhone upgrade, her name and number transferred over. Let's not waste breath, waste breath asking. And then let my pocket decide is also a little too, I don't know, too, um, I would just end it here. Let's not waste breath asking. And, and let it kind of let that hang. Um, Katie Dozer says, um, Funny and unexpectedly sweet and sad too, though. Sad. I, I feel I find it sad. Um. Yeah, yeah. So, so what I yeah. So I think there's a great, great concept of a poem here, Gordon. And and like I said, what I would focus on is um, it's just making the opening more interesting. Um, and there's a lot of ways it sees I the um you know the keys or the spearmint gum, what you're fidgeting for. Um, just more of that and, and more examples of what people might have done um, and sort of throw us off too and think that we're just having this this you know light poem about about butt dialing and then um, and then we get the, the the emotional aspect of it which I, I just love I love the uh, the structure and the title too <laughs> Joe Barker says top 10 title I like it a lot Yeah. Okay. Let's keep going. Keep it going. Keep it going. It is the hour mark. So if anybody has to bail out because you got to go back to work or whatever, I don't blame you. No, no, uh, no hard feelings. Um, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have seven left. I don't know. We'll, we'll see what we can do. So here's if they're short. Uh, I'll do. Sh if they're short, I'll do them. If they're longer, I'll skip them. I think that's how. And we'll see if we can get to everything. But this is. Uh, Let's see. This is uh, Clayton Clark, um, a poem for today, Blame. And here's Clayton Clark's poem, Blame. I hear him in the kitchen imagining cats into existence. That's all it takes, really. No need to care for or feed so-called live ones. We live like this now in our heads, aging, making macchiatos and toast. What's that, I say, as I soft shoe in with Chewy, my great Dane, he, the man on his knees, wiping a stain from the floor, looks up, eyes wet. He raises the moist towel. This is Winston, the tabby, my favorite. Chewy saunters to his kibble dish. I take the man's hand, my man. He stands, shaking, says, I should never have conjured him here in the first place. Blame. Hmm. Interesting. I can hear him in the kitchen imagining cats into existence. What a great first line. I love that. I mean, like like the line break there. Um, uh, the cats into existence is such an unexpected turn. It's really it's so. I mean, the title and and since there's so much sort of spark in the first line, I think that the title is simply blame works fine and kind of well almost as a contrast. Like you almost expect it to to be sort of simple, and then there's that great line. Um, that's all it takes, really. No need to care for or feed so-called live ones. We live like this now in our heads, aging, making macchiatos and toast. What's that, I say, as I soft shoe in with Chewy, my Great Dane. And so I have to imagine, you know, that the Great Dane's imaginary, too. He, the man on his knees, wiping a stain from the floor, looks up. 
Eyes wet, he raises the moist towel. This was Winston, my, the tabby, my favorite. Chewy saunters to his kibble dish. I take the man's hand. My man, he stands shaking. I should never have conjured him here in the first place. So you, you're, you're all sending me poems that are too good. <laughs> I don't know what to say about this. I, I really, this one, I don't know what to change. I really like it. Um, does anybody else have any other suggestions for Clayton? Yeah, that's the thing. I think uh, that's what I took out of it. So Cindy Putnam Guntherman says, um, blame is so interesting. Maybe he has dementia. That's what I thought. Yeah. Joe Barker says top shelf. It is t- it's top shelf stuff, which is why we don't do this every week, honestly. Um, Potter O'Donohue says, I like blame. Joe Barker says originality. Yeah. So yeah, that was my take. It was like my take on this, which, and I love kind of that. I don't know exactly. Like I love the ambiguity because it's so vivid and unusual and original. Um, I really enjoy the ambiguity of not exactly knowing what the explanation is. A lot of times you'll hear me say like, we need to know what's going on, but sometimes just the poem and the, the originality and the, how interesting it is can carry it through. And if, if you can manage to pull that off, having the ambiguity of how to interpret it is like an addition instead of a, um, instead of a like negative. And so, um, and I think that's the case here. I think it's just really good. It lets us try to like imagine what is really talking about. I think there are two options. It's kind of a, a dementia and the, and the speaker is playing along with the dementia, which is just a beautiful kind of thing. Or maybe there's some kind of like empty nest syndrome type thing going on. And, and it's just a f- game they play, which is like funny, fun, but also sad. I'm not sure how to take it. Um, but I think it's a beautiful poem and touching. And as, um, um yeah so mary dean carter says love she loves my man and that it is so um yeah so i take the man's hand my man that's just such a great clarification such a simple thing so powerful thanks for pointing that out it's true um katie dozier says uh really has me thinking tiny one that i only mentioned because the poem is so amazing that i wouldn't capitalize macchiatos yeah neither would i my instinct is that it wouldn't be capitalized. I don't think there's a reason to. So one tiny critique or edit. Yeah. But this is a great poem. I really like it. Thanks for sharing it. Um, Sorry for not being any more helpful, but it's really good. Okay. Um, Moving along. We'll keep this all, this ball rolling. Go to Diane Knox. And uh, the Diane Knox poem. Make sure it's right. Yeah. Critique. Life is a fight. Life is a fight. Here we go. You struggle for a handle you cannot see. Instead, end up grasping the cutting edge. Your flesh is sliced. You are resilient. The gaps coagulate. You heal to deal with the next blade. The following objects are not as sharp, so you are lulled, less reluctant to enter the unknown. When you have reached complacency, the stab seems unreasonably cruel. Your senses are alerted. You are careful, reaching into the murky waters. Survival is the final cut. Cost is precious blood you pay to eliminate the crud. Very interesting. Cool rhyme there at the end, blood and crud. Um, life is a fight. Um, so so one thing we talk about um, is the the you poems. And, and there's, some, there's a way that that's just, it's the most distancing type of, um, what do you call it? What do you call a that i don't even know you know this is directed in the second person um you struggle for a handle you cannot see instead end up grasping the cutting edge your flesh is sliced you're resilient so so just it's a little stronger it just is it's such a such a small thing but if it was just like she struggles for a handle she cannot see instead ended up gasping grasping the cutting edge her flesh is sliced she's resilient the gaps coagulate she heals to deal with the next blade there's something because we're not like stuck with having this ambiguity of whether I'm talking to myself or I'm talking to somebody else or it's addressed to somebody um, because that collapses. If we just use a third person instead of second, we get to experience the images and scenes a lot, a lot better. So for the second person, it's usually reserved for when you want to play with that aspect or, you know, when it's very clear that it's a direct address and that adds something to the poem. Um, so often if it's, if it's a poem, like that where it's supposed to be addressing somebody put that in the title so we know before we even go in who it's to like dear blah 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 
um, is just the simplest example, like dear so and so. Um, yeah, and so and so Cindy says it, it's another option for the you is that it could be a universal us, which is what Cindy Guntherman says. I mean, so it could be if if that's what you want to go for, just say that we struggle for a handle we cannot see, or we struggle for handles we cannot see. Instead, grasping the cutting edge, there's a little bit um, of clutter too, like the ended up. Um, but so imagine this: we struggle for the ha- for handles we can't cannot see. Gra- instead, grasping the cutting edge, our flesh is sliced. We're resilient. The gaps coagulate. We heal the deal with an X blade. That even works better too. Um, okay, so then the following objects are not as sharp. So you are lulled, less reluctant to enter the unknown. When you have reached complacency, the stabs seem unreasonably cruel. Your senses are alerted. You are careful, reaching into murky waters. Survival is the final cut. Cost is precious blood you pay to eliminate the crud. Very interesting. Yeah, so um, uh, Potter O'Donohue says, uh, Why is survival the final cut? I don't understand the ending. Yeah, that has me lingering on the poem, but in an interesting way. Um, um, survival is the final cut. Like that's the that's the question that I think the poem is set to to make you ruminate over. Survival is the final cut. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it makes me want to ruminate on that thought. Um, like what you have to do to survive. Cost is precious blood. You pay to eliminate the crud. Hmm, very interesting. So this one, I think, I think some clarity into what that ending means. I think that's the right thing to talk about. So I would go for, you know, get rid of the you, make it a we, and um, go a little farther to explain that ending so we understand a little bit more. I think survival is the final cut is a great line. But then the problem is, I think, cost is precious blood. You pay to eliminate the crud. Even though I, I did say I like the rhyme, it um it doesn't add any kind of explanation where it feels like it it needs to point us in some direction. So I think that's the main issue that could help. Oh, there's another line. I missed it. There was two. Sorry. Well, that might change everything. Since the double gap, I didn't scroll down far enough. So uh, close that gap so we don't do that maybe. But not a kiss on the lips. Life is a fight for a knife in the mud. Let me read the whole poem again without screwing up and missing the last two lines because that might change things. Life is a fight. And it, it won't change anything about the, the you, you stuff we talked about most, but it might change the ending thing that, that Potter Downer he was talking about. So let's read the whole thing. You struggle for a handle you cannot see. Instead, end up grasping the cutting edge. Your flesh is sliced. You are resilient. The gaps coagulate. You heal to deal with an X blade. The following objects are not as sharp as you are lulled, less reluctant to enter the unknown. When you have reached complacency, the stabs seem unreasonably cruel. Your senses are alerted. You are careful reaching into murky waters. Survival is the final cut. Cost is the pre- is precious blood you pay to eliminate the crud. Not a kiss on the lips. Life is a fight for a knife in the mud. I do like that fight for a knife in the mud. is interesting. That kind of brings the poem around. Um, Pat O'Donnell says that's a better ending. And and uh, Jenny Middleton says, does the ending link back to the idea of fighting in the title that life is a fight? Yeah, I think it does. So so I think the ending works a little better, but still, um, let's see, cost is precious blood. You pay to eliminate the crud. Eliminating the crud doesn't really fit. So maybe just cut this line. And we already have the blood mud rhyme, if you want to rhyme at the end. I think maybe, yeah, so Sharon Ferranti says and the end might be better at the beginning. What I'm thinking here, fight, life is a fight, um, is a kind of a weak title anyway. What if, um, what if this was the title, not a kiss on the lips, and this was the first line? And then we use the second, or um, we instead of um, you. I mean, that might just fix something. So, not a kiss on the lips is the title. Not a kiss on the lips. Life is a fight for a knife in the mud. We struggle for a handle we cannot see, instead ending up grasping the cutting edge. Our flesh is sliced. I think that the resilient I would cut anyway. And the gaps coagulate. I think this goes on a little too long. 
Let's just skip that. The following objects are not as sharp, so we are lulled, less reluctant to enter the unknown. I can cut the unknown, too. When we have reached complacency, the stabs seem unreasonably cruel. Our senses are alerted. We are careful, reaching to murky waters. Survival is the final cut. Cost is precious blood. Something like that. that that's probably what i do. Yeah, good suggestion, Sharon. Yeah, and General Jenny Middleton agrees. Okay. Yeah. And Deb, she says, what about the first person? So, yeah. Attractive Faith, he says, I might interpret this poem as how difficult it is with all that's going on in the world. Eliminate the crud. Could be. Don't engage with negativity. Oh, that's an interesting take. I like that. Okay, let's uh, let's keep going, though. Let's keep going. These are, these are fun. I really love the um, the open line shows. And if you can stick around, we'll we'll keep going. Gosh, it's already 10, 15, though. For me. Okay. So this is Isaac Lewis. He says, longtime listener here. My poem is about falling in love at a bar named the Douglas Fir. That's interesting. So um, I'd like to get through. You know what? I'm just going to do all these. And if you have to leave, you can leave. Um, but I'm just going to go through them all. And you can come back. If you have to leave, come back later and you'll see what we said about yours. And if you got to go because you got something else to do, that's fine. But there's there's a few left. We'll go on for another 15 minutes. That's fine. Here we go. Douglas Fir. Ducking slyly onto the bar patio, reeling slightly, ears ringing, feet unsteady. I clutch your arm, and in your smile I am buoyed up like bubbles running down my knuckles. Every New Year's to come, and we sit, finally. In that mute space, I offer you a smoke from a thrifted cigarette case, and you hold it like Joan and peek over your glass. And now, watching you watch me through what isn't just smoke and isn't just the music, and what can't be just my drink, I realize the water has reached my neck and the rock I've been balancing, I've been balanced on, seems to have disappeared. Yeah. So um, I like this one too. I just like these all. So I love, I'm, I'm not sure. I kind of wish, um, let's see, the, that um, um, Isaac hadn't mentioned that in the in the note that the bar, that the Douglas fir was a bar. Because I wonder, I don't think I would have got that. I might have been, Oh, no, I would have. Ducking slyly into the bar ca- patio. Douglas Fir, ducking slyly onto the bar patio, reeling slightly, ears ringing, feet unsteady, I clutch your arm, and in your smile I'm buoyed up like bubbles running down my knuckles every New Year's to come, and we sit, finally, in that mute space. Yeah, so Padre O'Donnell, he says, I don't know why I like this, but I really do. I agree. Like, I'm really transported to it. Um, like bubbles running down my knuckles every New Year's to come, and we sit finally. This is one section that I felt a little confused by. It's hard to follow. I like the and in your smile and buoyed up like bubbles running down my knuckles, but then every New Year's to come. Um, since the present tense, every New Year's to come, and we sit finally. I, I'm, I'm a little thrown off by this line, that every New Year's to come. I'm not sure what to make of it. In that mute space, I offer you a smoke from a thif- thrifted cigarette case, and you hold it like Joan and peek over your glass. And now, watching you watch me, it's the, I guess what I love is the intimacy of this, this you know, and the details. The thrifted cigarette case, you hold it like Joan and peek. I'm not sure who Joan is. Um, is Joe Didion? I don't know. Um, but... Um, but like, I think there's something intimate, too, about the reference not being told. There's a real intimacy to these two, the speaker and the figure. Um, yeah. And now, watching you watch me through what isn't just smoke and isn't just music. And that's a great line, too. Um, and now you watch me through what isn't just smoke and isn't just the music and what can't be just my drink. That repetition, that rule of three is in there. So we get the three things in the list, which feels very pleasing to us because we recognize the pattern. I realize the water has reached my neck and the rock I've been balanced on seems to have disappeared. I wonder, there's that whole, um, you know, I say it many times, but it's just one of those famous things that that um, in, the, in the Wasteland, uh, when Pound was revising it for Elliot, he writes perhaps be damned because he because uh Elliot wrote perhaps in one line and and it is you're like hedging against 
the possibility rather than just saying it. And so I think with the last line, instead of seems to have, I would just say has disappeared. Like be confident in that and let it happen. I realize the water has reached my neck and the rock I've been balanced on has disappeared. That's stronger. Um, but this whole stanza, I love that. And, and the setup and the intimacy and that mute space, I offer you a smoke. I, I, I don't know. The other thing, I think maybe, hmm, I don't know. It's just this section right here, I think, could be stronger. Um, I mean, do we need this? Is this just sort of filler? What if we just say Douglas Fir ducking slyly into that bar patio, reeling slightly, ears ringing, feet unsteady, I clutch your arm. In that mute space, I offer you a smoke from a thrifted cigarette case. Like, what, what does this add? The bubbles and the New Year's and then sitting finally? I think maybe just jump. For, you know, close that off and jump to the mute space. I think that might be stronger that way. Uh, for Joan, um, Mary Dean Carter says Joan Crawford. Uh, which, yeah, that's a possibility too. I, I, but I think there's, there is that the Joan is not named actually makes it more intimate because the person you're speaking to would know who you're, which Joan you're referencing. And we kind of sort of intuitively sense that. So I think in that place, um, yeah, I, I think in that place it works. Yeah. Everybody loves the watching you watch me. I think that's, that is a great line. So, um, um, where, uh, Joe Barker says, could the title be at the Douglas fir bar and then remove the bar from the first line? Yeah, actually, I think that's a great suggestion, too. Very small, but um, but a great suggestion. So I think that makes it a better title, and we don't get confused why it's called that. They're, like I said at the very beginning, we know that the bar is called the Douglas Fir because um, um, cause Isaac mentioned that to us in the email, but we don't know if we're just watching, uh, if we just, if we, we don't know if we would have known that without him telling us. I don't think we, I think we might be a little confused. So... Um, Joe Barker says, could the title be at the Douglas fir bar and then remove the bar from the first line? So it would be at the Douglas fir bar, ducking slyly onto the patio. I think that does work better. So I think I would, I would do that. Um, or just the Douglas fir bar maybe, but but yeah, so it's a great poem though. A couple little tiny tweaks, but another great one. I really like it. Okay. Let's see. How many do we have here? We still have. Now 18 watching on Facebook and uh, 20. A few people had to go on YouTube, but that's good. We got a good crowd of uh, almost 40 people here, which is nice for uh, 20 minutes past the time the show is supposed to end. Let's keep it going. And uh, we got a few left. And I, I saw that a couple are haiku up at the top, so that'll be quick. Um, this is Guy McKenney, or Gay McKenney, sorry, Gay. Gay McKenney, Grandmother's Multicolored Pots. Is this too long? Hmm. I think this is too long for how fast we're moving. It's a two-pager. I'm going to star this and maybe do it next week. Let's do that, if I can remember. Let's move up to Stephen Smith. There's a short one. Stephen Smith, Janie. Janie is beautiful. I did ask for short poems, so it's a two-pager just is going to be too much. I, I really want it to be 10 minutes more. Janie is beautiful. So here, this is Stephen Smith. Janie is beautiful. It's a shame she doesn't know it, because she was raised by wolves who teased her about the short snout and awkward posture running on all fours. But she is beautiful. I told her so right before she bit through my jugular. <laughs> Very fun poem. Um, I think the um, the raised by wolves, of course, is a bit of a cliche, even though that's what the poem is all about. Um Janie is beautiful. It's a shame she doesn't know it because she was raised by wolves who tease her about her short snout and awkward posture. That's the part I love, running on all fours. The detail here. It's just a great example of how detail makes things sort of sing. And so we get this te- being teased about her short snout and awkward posture running on all fours. I think that that's really cool. Um, but she is beautiful. I told her so right before she bit through my jugular. Hmm. I think the, um, I don't know, I think there needs to be a more interesting way to say that at the end. Um, right before she bit through. How could you How could you make that ending kind of sing? <laughs> yeah. Um, Deb T says, Janie Poe made me laugh. Yeah, it is kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so City Putnam Gunther likes that too. And, and Joe Barker says tight story. I think for this, yeah, I would just, I like it. And, and you know, I was going to say, and I kind of got sidetracked, that the being raised by wolves taken literally like that sort of turns it on its head and makes use of the cliche. So there's nothing wrong with using the cliche there. I think that's fine. Um, and the title, since it, re- it reads into the first line, works too. Janie is beautiful, and, and that's what it's about. It's a shame she doesn't know it because she was raised by wolves who tease her about the short snout and awkward posture running on all fours. But she is beautiful. I told her so right before. I don't know. It just doesn't. The last line just doesn't hit it home. If it could just. I don't know. Does anybody have any suggestions for what to say? Sharon? Sharon says, cool, but yes, I would fix up the ending. It's just a little kind of. Uh, what it is is like almost what you would expect, even though you don't know to expect it. But once you see it, it's like what you would expect. And then that's a bit of a letdown. And so if there could just be a, a way to make that interesting, instead of like a continuation of what is coming, to be even more surprising. Um, I mean, just just make that... I mean, I guess through the juggler might be the problem. Could you just bite somewhere else? I mean, not an ankle, though. Um, hmm... I don't know. I'm trying to think, but but I'm not sure. But that is what I would work on. And again, this is like the title problem where we don't have a title that works. Like, just iterate. Like, just make up stuff. Throw out ideas until something comes that, that you hear is the right um, the right thing. Sharon Front says, I would have it say right before she turned ugly. Oh, that'd be good. Yeah, to twist on the beautiful. Yeah. Um, Katie Dozier suggests, and I saw the blood dotting her fur. Interesting. Yeah. Or just the blood on her fur, or something like that. Yeah, that could work too. Ugly. Yeah, so play with it like that. Just throw out ideas. I think that's the the only thing is that the poem is missing some kind of up jump, like pushing it further with the last line rather than staying in the same place. Okay. Yeah, thanks for sending that. And a short one too. It was Stephen Smith. Let's see. Oh, and here's Katie Dozier with two. Um, I think I don't know if I can. Let's see. I want to. I try not to reveal anybody's email addresses, and that, since they're haiku, it's going to be hard not to. Let me pull up a word document really quick. Um, we'll put it in a word document. And so this is. Um, here we go. Then we need the word document here it goes fascism let me zoom in a little bit too does that work yeah okay fascism two ways so this is a two haiku uh, poem fascism two ways top hat black velvet names rabbit list of lemons sliced oh that is great fascism two ways top hat black velvet names rabbit I'm not sure what to make of that, but it's fascinating. But then List of Lemons, Sliced, is a great, especially with that title of fascism. Um, that is a really cool cool way to think of it in, in a reversal of the first line. Top hat, black velvet names. What if, I'm, I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure what to make of the first haiku. Top hat, black velvet. It feels like it could just be top hat, black velvet rabbit. Um Let's see. Top hat, black velvet. I I don't know. I think maybe, hmm. But again, it's just, I love it otherwise. Top hat, black velvet names, rabbit. Hmm. That's the one thing. Joe Becker says, love the details. Putter King O'Donohue says, you pull a rabbit out of a hat. Yeah, so it's like a magic. Yeah, Sharon Ferrante loves it. Yeah, and so, hmm. Yeah, Katie, Katie's here, and she says, was trying to allude to names being picked out of a hat. Hmm. Hmm. What if it was, um... Names picked out of a top hat rabbit? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. That's that's what I would play with, but I, I love it. And then the list of lemon slice is just great. So yeah, I think I would play with that first. But maybe other people have other suggestions. 
Let me look at the. So uh, Richard or Dick Westheimer says, "So I see a cabaret in the first haiku." And Vidya Kumar says, "Love the alliteration of list of lemons." Yeah, me too. That's really great. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I just think the first haiku is not quite there. Um, ah, so Sharon Friday says, top hat, so black velvet, the rabbit. I like that edit a lot. So maybe that's it. Good job. But that list of lemon slice is just perfect. And having the second haiku be that is really great too. Um, yeah, good stuff. So let's go next to uh, the last one, right? Yeah, this is the last one because I think – and I don't have time for gals. It's already at half an hour past time. Here's um, Potter O'Donohue, and he, uh, too, is a short poem. So I can't share it without revealing his uh, his address. Actually, I can because uh, his address, he probably wants you to know because he wants you to send you poems for PB Magazine, Poetry Bus Magazine. So here we can we can do a shout-out to that, too. That is uh, Potter O'Donohue's uh, magazine. So check that out, the Poetry Bus Mag at gmail.com right here um, and here is uh, Potter's poem that face beautiful in a pretty way an expensively cheap way silent if not desperate and that perfect curve almost hidden like the arc of a perfect decline oh that's just great too gosh these are just too good <laughs> that face beautiful in a pretty way an expensively cheap way silent if not desperate and that perfect curve, almost hidden, like the arc of a perfect decline. It's a great ending on that. Yeah. Um, hmm. Again, I don't know what else to say. It's just, it's just good. I like it. It's very evocative. Yeah, Katie Dodger says, great poem. Um, yeah. What can you say about that? I mean, that face is a great title. I'm not sure about the period at the end. Um, beautiful and a pretty... Because it just makes me think about why is there a period at the end. Although, I, it kind of works, though, too. Um, um, uh, Potter O'Donoghue says, I was wondering about the two perfects. No, I think it works because you have the, you have the parallel. It's it's like repeating the pattern of repetition, <laughs> funnily, but um, that face beautiful in a pretty way, an expensively cheap way. So you have the ways and the and the phrasing repeated, and then the perfect being repeated feels right uh, because it's it's repeating that a pattern that we've already established. Um, Sydney uh, Putnam Gunderman says, "I like the expensively cheap." Yeah, so so that face beautiful in a pretty way, an expensively cheap way. It just it's evocative. It makes you wonder what he's what is actually being said here. Silent if not desperate. That's each line is just interesting in its own way. That perfect curve, almost hidden. I mean, the almost is great too. Like the arc of a perfect decline, and then of course a perfect decline. I, I don't know. I think it's really nice. Um, Katie Dodger says I like the period at the end since the title has one too. Yeah, and and that face. I think the period does work. The more that I think about it, because. Um, you know, it makes it like a statement. I think it maybe is necessary. It makes it a statement, that face, you know? Yeah. And it's one of these sort of like, it feels to me like a kind of honest love poem, um, which I like a lot. There's nothing I would change about it, Potter. Sorry. Um, although Potter, yeah. Joe Barker says, G gifted listeners. It's true. I mean, if you're watching this, you're, you're really good. And it's just a matter of sending your stuff out to get it published and, you know, sticking at it and don't, don't be, um, understanding that, that the publishing is a game and it takes time and you're just putting in your your tickets but um but they'll be all be picked up it's good stuff so yeah thanks for sharing this everybody it's been a lot of fun that was the critique of the week for today um 90 minutes this week but we did a lot of fun stuff um, i think maybe next time that we do a grab bag i'll just trust that we have so many people who want to do it that we'll just do the whole show that way like next month when we do it that way so um but yeah a lot of fun let's see so next week's guest on the Rattlecast is going to be, yeah, Robert Pinsky. 
you know, former poet laureate. You've seen him on PBS constantly. Um, you know, author of uh, many books of poetry and a new memoir, Jersey Breaks, Becoming an American Poet, that just came out from Norton last week. So you can be on the show talking about that, reading some poems, um, talking about growing up in Jersey and becoming a poet. And um, I mean, the title says it all. It's going to be fascinating, though, to talk to Robert Pinsky. Also, on this uh, episode of the Rattlecast, we're going to have Carrie Gunter Seymour coming back. She was a guest and also interviewed in an issue of Rattle last week last summer or maybe two summers ago so early episode of rattle was it last summer i think last summer um but she has a new book which uh it's too far to reach and i can't remember the title but we will learn all about it in a special bonus segment like we like to do for returning guests when they have new books so that'll be uh rattlecast number 164 with robert pinsky the prompt for this week was to write and i'm going to look up this word and, and try to say it right again um an and Had and Hadi, and Ed Hadi, is a unique kind of Tamil poetry constructed such that the last or ending word of each stanza becomes the first word of the next stanza. In some instances, the last word of the series of the stanzas become the beginning of the very first stanza, thus making the poem a true garland of stanzas. And Ha means end, and Adhi means beginning. So that is the prompt for this week to write an And Hadi poem. Uh, which has that unique stanza structure. There's a poem on Rattle you can check out called Circles by Nikita Park, who gave us this prompt. So if you just type in uh, rattle.com, Nikita Circle or something, you'll find that poem for an example. But that is your prompt for this week to write an Ad Hadi poem. Uh, and then we'll talk to Robert Pinsky and Carrie Gunter Seymour. Rattlecast number 164, the regular time, Monday, October 17th, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great weekend in the meantime, and I will talk to you later. Goodbye. <laughs>